So this is the Time Dollar book by Edgar Kahn that has all the wonderful stories about things you can do if you're willing to bank your time. Now, I've urged Edgar over the years to correct what I consider a fatal flaw in the system. And that is that everybody's time, they mandate, be the same. And that means that a doctor's time is worth, worth the same thing as a babysitter's time, so that you don't have many doctors participating, right? But at the last Time Dollar convention, I believe it was in 2005 or four in King City, uh, I attended. And at the time, they were experimenting with time tokens. Little six-minute tokens worth a tenth of an hour. And it was at that moment in time that I decided I was going to try and demonstrate how a free market would work with time tokens. And so I pulled out my accordion, which I brought with me. I opened it up and I started playing songs and asking people to throw in contributions to me. And over the space of one hour, I brought in 41 time tokens worth 4.1 hours. And that means that my time was worth 4.1 hours per hour because that's what I got out of the free market. And my purpose was to determine that when you have your own paper tokens, physical tokens, the central guys cannot control who makes how much. And that's when the free market kicks in. And I mean a real free market that's free when everybody has access to credit, not just the rich guys. So anyway, the story, my favorite story about the nuns in El Paso, Texas, who set up a time bank and brought child mortality down. This is heartwarming. The whole book is great. I have SBN 087857 9850. Grab it while you can. It's going to be an archive heirloom. Time Dollars. Advocated by Johnny Engineer Turmel. Centro San Vincente. From ability to pay to willingness to give. When Phyllis and Joe. Almijo scheduled a retreat in early 1990. The mission of the Daughters of Charity Health Clinic in El Paso seemed in jeopardy. The order, known for the charity hospitals it operates around the world, had already been forced to sell Hotel Dieu, the one it had operated in El Paso for nearly a hundred years. To keep faith with the poor of the city, the Daughters had op opened the clinic, Centro San Vicente, in the poorest, most underserved part of town. Now it too was in trouble. The staff of 15, plus 30 volunteers, consisted of sisters from the order and community people. They had recruited Armijo, the dynamic public affairs officer from a local hospital, to be director. When the center opened in November 1988, expectations were high. By some measures, the results were promising as well. San Vicente, as the clinic was known, served over 7,000 needy residents during the first year and a half, with services ranging from immunization to prenatal care. The clinic pioneered an award winning health program for diabetic women. Yet, for all these efforts, the community's medical needs remained staggering. The more Centro San Vicente did, the more it seemed to fall behind. The lack of basic sanitation made the area a breeding ground for disease. The needs of the residents were matched only by their inability to pay for care. The Daughters of the Charity run a lean operation, and the nuns on staff work for a pittance. Their reward comes from the service itself. Still, they found themselves caught in the classic dilemma of medical aid to the poor. Needs were escalating out of control, yet there was no money to pay for the care already delivered, despite increased revenues from donations, clinic fees, and foundation grants. It was the old debate, you can't fulfill your mission if you do not survive, but if you focus on survival, you can easily lose sight of your mission. The board had put it bluntly, we will continue to provide a subsidy, but if you don't stabilize your income and balance the budget, you must be prepared to close shop. As a last resort, Arma Joe and the staff of Centro San Vincente began to think about time dollars as a way to bridge the gap between resources and needs. The result was better than anyone had hoped for. Today, Centro San Vincente is a case study of how a clinic serving the poorest of the poor integrated time dollars into a conventional accounting system. The step changed the fee structure in a radical manner. The old approach was to charge according to ability to pay. Now, Centro San Vincente looks at ability to give as well. Time!
serving the poorest of the poor. El Paso is the poverty capital of the United States. Almost two out of four residents fall below the poverty line. Lower Valley, the area directly outside the city, is even worse. This strip of land between Interstate 10 and the Mexican border is filled with shanty settlements called colonias. There's no water, no sewage, no transportation between the city limits and the border, and that means no access to medical care, schools, or jobs. No jobs means no tax base to finance schools or the community needs. Locals call it zip code 79915, the way one might say Stalag 17. Health problems here are legion. Diabetes, anemia, malnutrition, substance abuse, the list goes on. By the time children from the colonias are school age, most have had hepatitis. 80% of the babies in the colonias are born to teenage mothers, resulting in many premature infants. The cost of caring for one is $10,000 the first day and $2,000 per day thereafter, with an average hospital stay of 45 days. Many of these don't live long, despite the care and expense. The medical needs of the colonias are compounded by the patient's lack of money to pay for care. Only a quarter of the physicians who practice in El Paso, Texas, a county, will accept Medicaid, Medicare patients. Many of the people whom Central San Vicente serves are not eligible for either federal program anyway, or else they have not applied. One in three clients come from families earning under 5000 a year. Four out of five families are below the poverty line. When Central San Vicente Board met in 1989, the burning issue was the fee schedule. Considering the volume of service rendered, the clinic was not generating much income. Why couldn't the fees be raised, the board wanted to know. Why couldn't collection rates be better? The obvious questions. But all the answers led to the same dead end. Don't increase the fees and the red ink continues to flow. Increase the fees and the mission is violated. Most clients can't pay the fees anyway. They pay what they can, 30 to 40 percent of the actual cost of the service at best. Possibly a few clients could be signed up for Medicare, but the number of eligibles would never be great. Moreover, their clientele is particularly wary of entanglements with the federal government. After a meandering discussion, the board did what boards often do. It dumped the problem back on Armajo's lap, improved the collection process they said. Armajo is a slightly built woman who wears her hair pulled back from a delicate face. She avoids flamboyant clothing, but there's always an understanding feeling of old tapestry in the dresses she wears or the shawl draped around her shoulders. Armajo greets visitors to the clinic as a gracious hostess with a warm smile and charming deference. In addition, she, however, moves like quicksilver through the clinic, speaking quickly, noting every detail, greeting every patient individually and warmly. In an auditorium, standing small behind a tall podium, she can hold an audience spellbound with phrases alternately soulful and stirring, fiery but somehow gentle. One of her weapons is the knowledge that others will underestimate her determination and staying power. In Armageo's office is a dog-eared paperback book bearing the dry title Community-Oriented Primary Care. This collection of essays, her Bible, was published in the mid-1970s. That was the era, era when the baby boom began to descend upon the nation's medical schools and the problems of medical care in poor and rural areas became fashionable subject. The result was a new approach to medicine that looked not just at sore throats and tumors, but also at underlying social problems such as malnutrition. Somehow the focus had to shift from treatment to prevention from individual to community. But how? A sole practitioner working in a hamlet in Appalachia was hard-pressed to handle the cases in his or her waiting room, let alone address underlying social problems such as isolation and lack of sewers. No one had figured out how to make a community health care work on a practical level. Phyllis Armijo was still committed to the ideal, however. She had pioneered a nationally acclaimed program, Paso a Paso, Step by Step, in which female volunteers led diabetic women through an intensive course of exercise and education. Armijo wanted to expand the approach. The question was how, when she didn't have enough money for the day-to-day -day operations of the clinic. Three months after the stormy board meeting over fees, they held a weekend retreat for board and staff. Finances and the fee schedule were still very much in everybody's mind, but a new fact had been added. Armajo and several of the board members had seen an article in Newsweek magazine about the Time Dollar program. This new currency appealed to an intuitive sense that the people they served could be a resource instead of a burden. Armajo began the retreat with a simple question. What would happen if the clinic were to accept Time Dollars for its services instead of or in addition to regular dollars. What would it mean when clients paid with their time instead of just with money? 
Not surprisingly, the finance people immediately brought up the implications for the budget. Of course, they wanted to expand the client's activities, but wouldn't this new program require money? And wouldn't it reduce revenues even more? And if people could pay with time, why would they part with even the few dollars they pay now? Then, how could the clinic buy vaccines and other needed supplies that they need cash for, right?